Fifth book of Moses. And uh, chapter 10. There's a passage in here that... Uh, um, John Lacrosse uh, mentioned briefly as he gave a sermon the other day and uh, it struck me because of its uh, simplicity and uh, the way the way it pre the way it was presented it, it really struck home and uh, I thought I'd um, just share some thoughts I had about it in chapter 10 Start reading in verse 12 and go through verse 17. And now, Israel, what does the Lord thy God require of thee? But to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes which I command thee this day for thy good behold the heaven and the heaven of heavens belong to the Lord thy God the earth also with all that therein is only the Lord had a delight in thy fathers to love them and he chose their seed after them even you above all people as it is this day circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and be no more stiff-necked. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, a great God, a mighty and an awesome, who regards not persons nor takes reward. It struck me here, especially in verse 12, how neatly this was, was presented and how simply it was presented. God simply states to his people, to put it in a nutshell, this is what I want from you. This is what I require. Despite of all the revelation he's given, I could sum it up in very few words. And there's four things he asks. This is four things that I require of you. And uh, to require something it has the idea of an imperative. Okay, it's a command. It's something that God has a, a right to do, okay, just as a, a parent would require certain things from his children. Things that are, are essential, right, to his relationship to us. And that is to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul. That's four things. And the reason why I want to look at this is I feel that, uh, and I see it in my own life, that things become very, very complicated when it comes to living the Christian life. And uh, so complicated, in some cases, you know, Christians kind of break down, trying to achieve a certain plateau, or trying to achieve um, success in the Christian life. And I think they're, they're, they're missing the mark because they're not keeping it simple. We have uh, uh, certain prejudice, and uh, preachers have certain hobby horses that they want to get on, and uh, it drives us away from the simplicity of the Word of God. And we get off to the right and off to the left, and we start driving home our, our, our petty um, uh, hobby horses that we have, and, and we require this from people, we require that from people, and uh, I find myself getting uh, kind of confused about all of this. That uh, I should be doing this and I should be doing that. And uh, I, bec I become overwhelmed. And, um, and I think in the historical context, this is what is happening with the children of Israel. They had received the law and all the hundreds of different requirements that God had laid down. And, um, and when Moses came back from the mount, uh, the people had failed miserably. They were, they were, they had just kind of gone berserk. They were worshiping a golden calf, 
And, uh, and so now Moses is back up on the mountain and God simply <coughs> tries to simplify things. This is the context here, all right? Um, he, never he never stated it this way before, all right? And all that I require, he says, this is the spiritual impact. This is the intent of all these laws that I have, all right? And this is the way we should view the Christian life. It's not a bunch of do's and don'ts and all these little things that we have to, to do, but rather, if we're guided by God's principles, if we're guided by a certain attitude and a way of life, that, that will take care of all the rest. And um, perhaps the best way to illustrate this um, well, there's, there's a lot of, there's a babble of voices offering conflicting things from us. Um, let's say um, you were in charge of uh, traffic safety, or you were the head uh, in the OPP division of traffic safety, right? And uh, you wanted to make sure that everyone w on the highways and on the roads was, was doing the right thing so that there would be no accidents, right? And so you have to create all these laws to, to protect the, your, the citizens and, and to keep the, the road safe. Now, what would you have people to do right, if you had your choice? Would you, have, would you rather people um, know the letter of the law, to know every, like say there's about a thousand different laws concerning uh, the, the Highway Traffic Act. Would you have people to know that precisely and, and exactly and to follow that, to try to follow each one of those laws precisely? Or would you rather have people understand the intent of the laws? The intent of the law is to keep the road safe, to keep people safe from, from getting into accidents and whatnot, all right? And there's a lot of drivers out there um, who don't know the intent of the law, all right? For example, uh, they know that on secondary highways that the, uh, the speed limit is um, 50 miles an hour, I think it is anyway, all right? And so they feel justified in, in going around dangerous uh, uh, corners and sharp corners and, and over rough roads going 50 miles an hour because, well, that's the law. I'm keeping the law, right? I'm not disobeying the law. And... Uh, or perhaps they, they, the same person will go down to a very big city, Detroit or Toronto or whatever, all right, when, uh, during rush hour traffic, and everybody is going about 10 miles or 15 miles an hour over the speed limit, all right? And so they're going to say, well, the law says that I'm supposed to go, I can go between, um, I can go between 50 and 60 miles an hour, so I'm going to go 50 miles an hour while everybody is going 70, all right? See? You can see the potential for uh, a real problem there. And the same thing can happen in the Christian life, all right? We can get hung up on all the specifics and all the requirements and all the commands that we miss the intent, all right? The intent of the traffic laws is that people will be, will be safe, all right? And this is what God would have his children understand. Now, for the time being, forget about all these little things, but if, if you've... If you're, if you're guided by these principles to fear the Lord, to walk in all His ways, to love Him, to serve Him with all your heart, with all your soul, in sincerity, then all these things will fall into place. All right? And uh, especially when you consider the fact that, uh, that these people had just failed miserably. All right? They had failed the Lord. And uh, what they needed to do was to get a, a start again. Now, I've felt this in my life, and, uh, and perhaps you've felt this also, that you've failed the Lord in some way. And the road to recovery is difficult. But what you have to do is to get back to basics, all right? Get back to basics, to keep things simple. We need to simplify things. We need to set specific goals. Not to be overwhelmed by all the the various commands and duties that we have. Okay, we need to reevaluate things. 
Okay, now, as we, as we go through these four things, I want you to note a few things. That every requirement that God gives, whether to fear the Lord, to walk in His ways, or to love Him or to serve Him, each one results in a particular blessing that we're going to receive because of it. Now, the, the Lord's going to set your life in order if, if you're guided by these principles. But on top of that, we find out from the Word that God promises us rewards, uh, special blessings um, that we haven't counted on if we're guided by this. All right? And secondly, I want you to notice that the theme of this passage is love. Okay, this is the overriding uh, guiding principle and uh, of, of, of all that's said here, and that is love. Just quickly, I want you to notice Matthew 22. In the New Testament, when Jesus was questioned about what is the intent of the law, if you could just kind of sum it all up, and that's basically what Deuteronomy 10, 12 is. This is a summary of the law. This is the basic intention of it. And I want you to get that in your head. Uh, the intent of the law rather than um, the duties of the law. Matthew 22, verse 35. Then one of them, one of the Sadducees, who was a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, and this is the question posed to Jesus Christ, verse 36, a master which is, or what is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all my mind, all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like to it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. All right? all the section of the, of, the, of the prophetical section of the Bible and all the law of the Old Testament, the whole thing is based on one overriding principle, and that is love. If love guides all that you say, if love guides all that you do, you can't go wrong, can you? When, when a, a situation occurs in your life, how, what am I going to do to handle this situation? And I, as I look back in my life, I can see uh, I've failed miserably in, in, in trying to uh, sort all the, the confusing things in my mind out, and I've handled it wrong because I wasn't guided by love. Right? And I, handled it, I mishandled situations. Right? But if you, if you keep in the back of your mind and all that you do and say and all, that, all your service for the Lord and whatever it is, if love, if love is a guy in principle, you can't go wrong. Okay? So if you can get this fact, okay, Brad, if you can get this fact established in your head, you'll have it in a nutshell. Okay. So the four basic things. Fear the Lord. Walk in all His ways. Love Him. And serve Him. First one, fear the Lord thy God. Now I want to make notice uh, one thing too, that perhaps there's an order, of experiential order here in uh, uh, the, our Christian experience. It, it begins with fear and it ends in service. You can't, when you become a Christian, just start serving the Lord uh, in an effective manner. You know, if, if, there's, if, if there is service without fear, without fear of the Lord, then it's mechanical. Uh, we know from 1 Corinthians 13, if we try to serve the Lord without love, we just we become like a, a bunch of, a, a bunch of racket, right? Like a tinkling cymbal. There, there's nothing. There's no value there whatsoever. It's just meaningless, a meaningless exercise. So there's an order to these things, and it, everything starts with fear. And I certainly learned this. You know, if 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 I possessed the fear of the Lord, in many cases, as I look back in my life, I would have stayed out of lots of trouble. Okay? And I'm sure you could, and Brad's laughing because he knows, he's thinking of himself. 
Okay. Fearing, fearing the Lord. Uh, how can you be saved without without the fear of the Lord first? You know, if you don't believe that He's going to send you to hell, well, you'll never you'll never trust the Lord as your Savior if you don't if you don't believe that God's going to do that. Um, you can't truly serve God without fearing Him first. You can't walk the Christian life without fear of the Lord. Because as soon as a, a temptation uh, is presented to you, uh, if you don't fear the Lord, then you'll have no qualms about disobeying the Lord right, and walking uh, contrary to Him. Very important, a very important first step. Our view of God is very important. These people that in this context that we're dancing around this golden calf worshiping it obviously they have not feared, did not fear the Lord they missed the most important step we must see him as a great God the one and only God they didn't they didn't see him as that we must see him as the creator as the holy very holy God we must see him as someone who is not to be fooled with definitely Proverbs 1 7 as a cross-reference to this. You don't have to turn there. But it's a well-known passage. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. You ever see a, a wise, a very wise person who has got it together you'll see a person who has a tremendous respect for God, who fears the Lord. This particular uh, phrase is repeated many, many times in the book of Proverbs. And the book of Proverbs, if you can be guided by um, the wisdom in the book of Proverbs, all right, then you've got things together. And even in here it says, despite of all these different things that I I'm asking you to do in the book of Proverbs, fearing the Lord, uh, is basic to it. It all can be summed up as, as fearing the Lord. Read Hebrews 12 sometime and you'll find out how important it is to fear the Lord. The last part of Hebrews 12, I was going to turn there, but we won't now. Hebrews 12, 28, look it up. Okay, and uh, there are certain rewards that come out of this. In... Um, while we're still in Proverbs, look in chapter 10, in verse 27. And these are, these are just a few of the, uh, the many, many promises that come out of this. Proverbs, what did I say, 10, 27? The fear of the Lord prolongeth days but the years of the wicked shall be shortened. And there's a, there's a, that's a, I find that a very amazing. Fearing the Lord means that a, a person, like generally speaking, will live a long life, live a long and happy life. In, um, this is just a few examples. In Revelation we're told, um, the nations were angry, and thy wrath has come. I'm sorry, uh, where is it? And the time of the dead, that they should be judged, that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, and to the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and should destroy them who destroy the earth. Okay, we're told specifically that specific rewards will be given in heaven to the saints, the prophets, any person that has a fear of the Lord. It's just an example of two. You have to quit there, but there are many, many examples of the blessings that, that, are, that come out of fearing God. The second step, once we learn to fear God, then we can walk with Him in fellowship. All right? And that's the next point. Walk in all his ways. Now, once again, you're going to become confused here, and you're going to say, okay, walk in all his ways. In other words, you have to do every little commandment that, that he requires of us. Well, I'm not saying you're not supposed to keep God's commandments at all, but 
What does he mean to walk in the ways of God? The ways of God are not necessarily uh, the 10,001 rules or commandments that he has laid down. But what are the ways of God? Think about it. Think about what the Bible says in, in the study that you've done. What is God? If you were, define, were to define God, there are three very important uh, things about God that stand out, things that we can define God by. We are told that God is light. We're told that God is spirit. We that worship Him, we must worship Him in spirit and truth. This is a very important aspect. And thirdly, God is love. The book of First John. Okay, those three things. God is light. God is spirit. God is love. And I found it interesting when you when you run a uh, reference check on on these three words, that we're we're told in many places, specifically to walk in light. We're told to walk in the spirit. We're told to walk in love. I'll give you some examples of that. In uh, 1 John 1, 7, walk in the light, as he is in the light, and we will have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse us from all sin. Walk in light. Walk in the spirit. Um, in Galatians, maybe we turn to Galatians. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. <coughs> now, <coughs> when I say walk in the Spirit, I say walk in light. What I'm, what I'm talking about here is, I talk about an attitude. I'm talking about, like everybody has a, their life is guided by a principle. Now, you've, you've heard people talk, talk about this. There's, there's a certain attitude that I have, a certain principle that kind of governs all that I do in my life. And to, to some people, it's uh, making, making money or whatever, something like that. Like, you hear a lot of people talk about some principle that, that kind of governs all that they do. And this is the idea of here, of walking in the light, walking in the spirit, um, it says, if you walk in a spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And he speaks the lust. The lust of the flesh are these. Okay, and he, he names them. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, adultery, sorcery, hatred, strife, etc. And then in verse 22, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control. Against such there is no law. You can try as you may to have joy, you can try as you may to have peace, you can try as you may to, to control your temper, to have self-control, to be good, to be gentle, but you can never do it without the Spirit of God, without the help of God. Doing it, doing it on your own is impossible. You end up uh, displaying the fruits of the flesh. Okay, To be guided in your life, to determine in your life that that I'm going to be led by the Spirit. The Spirit of God is, t is, is controlling me. Right? Then I will, I will fulfill the fruits of the Spirit. And in chapter 5 of Galatians, turn back in verse 2. Chapter 5, verse 2. Here, no, that's not it. Uh, Ephesians, try Ephesians 5. These are just uh, a couple of examples. There, there are many other references that we could go to. Chapter 5, Ephesians 5, verse 1, Be therefore followers of God as dear children, verse 2, and walk in love, as Christ also has loved us and given himself for an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Okay? Walk in love. And it's very interesting that God is love, God is spirit, God is light. And we're told to walk as, as a guiding principle for our lives in these areas. Okay? So when it says to walk in all his ways, it's exactly what he means. To walk 
as in light of, of who God is. Okay? We're also told in uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we walk by faith, not by sight. It's a principle that guides our life. And if these things guide your service for the Lord, if they affect, if, if they uh, control your things you do at play, at work, if they control your relationships with people, okay, then you've got it together. All right? The next step, we better quickly go to it. Uh, to fear the Lord thy God, we learn to walk in His ways, then He asks us to love Him. Okay? Love the Lord. Now remember we read in Matthew 22, 37, the whole, the whole law can be funneled into one important aspect, which is to love the Lord thy God with all my heart, with all my soul. Okay? Now, how do we love God? Something He's someone that we can't see. Okay? So loving Him physically in a physical manner is, is out of the question. You can't do it. So to many people, to many Christians, loving God simply means... Uh, to have a feeling of affection towards him. I love God because you know He's done all this for me, and I just have a good feeling about Him. I love Him. Well, this is totally hogwash because um, love is action. We're, we're told in First John three, you know, you can tell someone if someone comes to your door that, that's poor and hungry and thirsty, and you say to him, "Oh, I love you, and um, I really, I'm really concerned for you," and uh, then close the door on him. Love is what you do. When you think, uh, John, first John also tells us that we love him because he first loved us. We love him because he first loved us. So we think of, we think of ourselves loving God. We think, okay, I have a feeling of affection towards God. And now I ask you to think about what does it mean when God loved us? Or immediately you think about Jesus Christ coming to the earth and so God sacrificing his son. Could you give your son, put him on the altar to be killed at the hands of these wicked soldiers? He died for us to take care of our sins, to, to take our sins away, because he loves us. So love, you see, is, is doing something, right? And there's, so, there's too many pious people out there who, who can talk and, and about how much they love God and all this, but <clears throat> if that's all it is, then you have an empty, you have an empty faith. Love to God meant sacrificing His Son. And love to us means sacrificing ourselves to the Lord. John chapter 14, uh, how many times have, have we read this passage in, in this chapel? John 14. Verse 21. John 14, 21 says, well, we'll go back to verse 20 first. It says, At that day you shall know that I am in the Father, and ye are in me, and I in you. We have a, a, a very um, miraculous relationship. He that keeps my commandments and keepeth them, right? The person that keeps God's commandments and keeps them, guided by the Lord, he it is that loveth me. In God's opinion, the person that loves him is not the one who can talk about it the most, or has the greatest feeling, but it's the guy who keeps his commandments. That's the guy who loves. And he who loves me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and I will manifest myself to him. The benefits of loving God are plain. 1 Corinthians, the rewards, as I said, each command, each requirement results in a reward for us. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, first of all, um, verse 9, 
What's in store for the people that love God? 1 Corinthians 2 9 says, As it is written, eye has not seen, no human eye has seen, nor human ear has heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them. God has prepared all these wonderful things for who? For them that love him. Chapter 8, 1 Corinthians 8. Verse 3. I'll start in verse 2. And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knows nothing, yet as he ought to know. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. If any man love God, that person is known of God. Okay? Now, let's just, as I said, each one of these things, these blessings that I'm quoting from, there are many, many examples. We could, we could, we could list a, a huge number of them. I'm just giving you just a sampling of each one. And lastly, and quickly, serve the Lord thy God. Verse 12. Serve the Lord thy God. The pinnacle of this progression, first to fear him, to walk in his ways, to learn how to love him, when we get to that point, then we're able to serve him. Then we're able to, our service will mean something. When you come to the, to the realization in your life that my whole purpose, that nothing else ha is any value than giving myself completely to God, totally surrendering myself, I am yours, do with me as you wish. I want to serve you. And I just want to just read one verse in connection with that. And this is, I think this is the intention that he's giving here. This service is okay, not, uh, it's not a big list of help little old ladies across the street um, to preach 50 sermons a week, uh, to give X number of dollars to the church, uh, to comfort 45 people uh, per week, whatever. It's, that's not a, it's not a list of things we can do, but again, it's an attitude. Romans 12. Again, a very familiar... See, you know, following, following God the right way is not, it's not some uh, fancy thing that, that, that I could teach you from the Word of God, but it's this, simp this boring stuff, stuff we've heard all for years and years. And you just you have to get that in your head, that it's just, it's the boring stuff, really. Uh, when I ask uh, when my kids to help me, you know, or to do something, they get all excited and they want to do all these different things. But I say, no, I just want you to uh, clean your room up and this and that. Well, that's boring. You know, they don't want to do that. And that's what it is for Christians. You get uh, we we get the we get high-minded. We want to do all this and this and that. But we, we miss the, s the simple things, the basic things, and uh, the boring things. Oh, we've heard all that before. Yeah, sure, we're supposed to sacrifice our bodies to God's service. Yeah, okay. But now, let me get into the stuff that I want to do. And so we try to redefine what we're supposed to do for God. Romans 12, verse 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies... Now, whose body, who, who does your body belong to, okay? It's a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and that acceptable and perfect will of God. We get the attitude that uh, our lives are our own and our bodies are, are, are belong to us. But the attitude that God wants us to have is that I'm going to give it all to you. John 12 says, the person that serves God, him will God honor. Okay, so let's just try to summarize this. <coughs> he says, lastly, that and to do this with 
all your heart and with all your soul. And he's not talking just about serving God. He's talking about fearing Him, walking in His ways, and loving Him and serving Him. All those four things are, be do are to be done with all your heart and with all your soul. You can't partially fear God. You can't partially walk according to His ways. You can't partially serve Him or partially love Him. Or you're not doing it at all. It has to be with full intensity, right? Um, if, 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 you, if you say to your husband or wife, I'll stand by you uh, pretty well most of the time, what does that mean? <laughs> you know, I wouldn't want to have that kind of promise. I mean, God doesn't want that either. Okay, this is the spiritual impact of the laws of Moses. If the children of Israel had got a hold of this, you know, their success would have been a reality. The same for us. The whole idea of the New Testament is that God has done away with all the specific rules. And he wants us to be guided by principles. But we don't, we don't seem to get this in our head. We, we don't want to do that. And uh, we, we look for external gestures, for signs, for tokens of these things, you know. We, we, we do a token thing to show that we love God. We do a token thing to show that we, that we fear Him. We do a token thing to show that we want to serve Him. And uh, that's the sum total of, of the Christian life for a lot of people. Right? It's just uh, some external display, you know. And I've left and I've, you know, I, I encourage people to go to church. But, you know, it's not just going to church. People just want to satisfy God and their own conscience by saying, hey, I'm going to go to church. You know, I'll make sure I, ne I never miss a Sunday. But big deal. There's nothing in that that's of any value. You, you only go to church if you, if you have a heart that's right and you, you've given all to God and you want to serve Him. You go there because you want to go. You know, to make people do things, to make people obey the Lord in this manner, to make people do what's right, to make them come to church and to make them do this and that and the other thing uh, is of no value if they're doing it out of duty. We, we can't, uh, you know, because I, I, I know this, because I've, I found myself doing this many times in my life. And it was a total, utter waste of time. Okay? To conclude, instead of going through these verses, let's just skip down to verse 16. My point is, and... Not, not to get vulgar or anything, but he says here, circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and be no more stiff neck. Circumcision was a physical outward display that I was a Jew, that I was following God, and um, that I belonged to Him. Okay? It was a physical outward display. It was a physical thing. And that's all it was. God says... If you want to do something, circumcise the foreskin of your heart. The spiritual reality is so, is so far more important. I can't teach this to you. I can't explain it to you. I can't tell you how to do it, how to accomplish it. Right? Something that can't be taught. I, c I can teach you what's the best thing to do. I can could, I could explain the Word of God to you that we should be doing all these things. And so often, people sitting in their pews say, okay, well, I'm going to try to do all these things. That's not the point. You know, if I make everybody do all these things, it's of no value. Because unless something's happened inside here. Don't do that, Jerry said. That's the same thing. Okay, he says, Circumci circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart. This is what we have to do. Well, I, don't even, I can hardly understand what that means, let alone teach it to you. <laughs> I think this is something you have to realize in your own life to figure out. Okay? So what my point is, the, whole, the Christian life is, 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 to be gui is, a, is a thing of principle that you're to be guided by. To giving it all, okay? And everything I have, in every moment that I live, every person that I know, every place that I go, everything that I do, 
um, to be guided by this. And then I think we're going to start seeing some success in a Christian life. Then we're going to get on top of things and not be like this roller coaster that we so often find ourselves in. And um, this is something that I've been learning. And um, it's not something you can just happen overnight. But I wanted to point this out to you uh, because I see a lot of people getting discouraged, as, as I do quite often, with all that's involved in the Christian life. But remember, these, these simple, get back to some simple things, get back to the basics, and I think things will go better. Let's uh, close in prayer. Our Father, we thank you for your word and for the simplicity of it. So often we complicate things and keep us from doing that, Father. We simply uh, help us to surrender ourselves to you and, and to allow ourselves to be guided by you. Father, you are spirit, you are light, you are love, and, and help these things to uh, pervade in, in all that we do and say. Father, then I know that as you have promised, uh, we will have then have success. And uh, this will keep us from discouragement. We thank you for your love to us because you sent your son. Father, help us now to love you in return by our lives, by what we do. Thank you for this in Jesus' name.